This is Steve Ryan with Coastal Progressive and Rainbow Forum on Society Bites Radio, and today we have Samantha Allen, the author of Real Queer America. It is a fascinating novel, and I'm going to let her introduce here and tell us a little bit about what motivated her to write this beautiful book about her trip across America here and taking us looking through the Rust Belt to the Rio Grande and other places. Hi, I'm Samantha um, I am the author of Real Queer America, LGBT Stories from Red States, and it's such a pleasure to be with you. Uh, the book is the product of a two-month-long road trip that I took in the summer of 2017 through more conservative parts of the U.S., like Utah, Texas, Tennessee, Indiana, Mississippi, Georgia, and actually ending right here in Florida. Um, and it's, it's just kind of a showcase of LGBTQ life in some more conservative parts of the country. Excellent. Uh, I want you to detail, in fact, we have something in common here, too, because I did part of my undergrad work at IUPUI in Indianapolis uh-huh. and also took some courses on campus in Bloomington. So I'm especially interested in that one, <laughs> that part of your story. Yeah. And also the Rio Grande Valley. My last partner and I, we spent time in the Rio Grande Valley. So anyway, tell us a little bit about what you found there in, in your book that we're going to read in your book. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the places that I chose to go in my book were really special and important to me personally. You know, I came out as a transgender woman in Georgia. I met my wife in Bloomington, Indiana at the Kinsey Institute, which is housed in um, the Indiana University campus. Campus, right. World famous for that. Yeah. And uh, we met in the elevator, actually, which was like, I don't know, fate, the universe, something. Um, But the Rio Grande Valley was a place I had never been before until I wrote the book. And it stole my heart. What a special place that is. And the LGBTQ community there, um, you know, they they struggle with the cultural atmosphere of the Rio Grande Valley and yet are just such warm, kind, generous people. A lot of places that I went to in the book, I knew uh, a bit about who I was going to talk to beforehand. I had someone to guide me. I showed up in the Rio Grande Valley knowing absolutely no one and just had a friend from Austin say, uh, you know, talk to this person and talking to that person led me to the next person, that kind of thing. Before I knew it, I was having this amazing week in the Rio Grande Valley, just sitting around like coffee shops with genderqueer, non-binary folks talking about the experiences of being, you know, like undocumented, for example, or like um, uh, just living in this this vibrant, but also like a very challenging place. Of course, and I'm sure you saw there's horrible poverty yeah, in the Rio Grande Valley a, a, up against some extreme wealth too and that's that's one of the mo- most challenging things that they have down there too as well plus the fact that they are on the border and they have a lot of problems with drugs coming through the area and things like this so but tell me a little bit more about other areas too that you that you can remember in the book there that you you chose to document on your trip and and so give our readers a uh, hint into what they can get if they go out and get this book. Yeah, sure. So, you know, I mentioned earlier that I started the trip in Utah. I'm formerly a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, or the Mormon Church, as it's more commonly known. I left the church in my early 20s, uh, just a few years before I came out as a transgender woman and transitioned. Um, But when I was a college student in Provo, Utah, it did not seem like a place where I could be out as LGBTQ. This was 2005, and whether it was just because I was afraid or because, you know, it really was like, you know, the heart of Utah, I, I didn't feel like I could be myself there. Um, and so I was scared to go back when I wrote this book 12 years later. And when I went back, I found this amazing LGBTQ youth center called Encircle that was literally across the street from the Mormon temple. You could see it through the windows. Um, and I met a lot of LGBTQ youth, and I met a lot of parents who were supportive of them, both in the church and outside of the church. And to me, I kind of felt like Alice through the looking glass, like so <laughs> much had changed in that decade. And so I think for, for readers, it's a way to take some places like Utah that you might have some preconceptions about when it comes to LGBTQ acceptance and to kind of just catch up on what's been happening in these places over the last 10, 15 years. 
I was privileged to interview the other day another former LDS person that made history in the United States here in working on the Prop 8 uh, uh, agenda amendment in California. Yeah. And you may know him by it, who this is I'm referring to, too, because he, he he's a... Academy Award winner. That's that's Dustin. Dustin. Lennon. Yes, yeah. he's. An, I, I met him for the first time in person, and I was just blown away by his amazing work he's done. And and he told me too how much uh, the LDS uh, religion has changed. And acts also myself being ex LDS. That that was interesting too. Tell me some other things about your in your book here that you have documented in some other parts of the country. You mentioned the Kinsey Institute, mm. which, of course, is world famous uh, and being located on the on the main campus of IU in Bloomington. Tell me some of your experiences that you had there. Yeah, you know, Bloomington. And, and I know you met your wife there. Of course, yeah. With a true <clears throat> queer rom-com, basically, meeting my wife in an elevator. But uh, to me, I love the Kinsey Institute. I love IU, but... But more than that, I love Bloomington. Bloomington is kind of like, you know, quintessential American small town. But, you know, because it's a college town, like some of its politics run more progressive. And, you know, it's got a courthouse square that gets lit up during the holidays. And it's, you know, encircled by all these small businesses, many of which have, you know, LGBTQ supporting stickers or flags in the windows. Um I I love a place that feels small, like small town America, mm. but that feels really warm and welcoming for LGBTQ people. And I love that now, increasingly these days, LGBTQ people don't have to choose between being accepted or, you know, um, or living in a, a place like Bloomington. You know, I feel like it, you know, the story of the 20th century is rightly a story of urban migration for LGBTQ folks. We went to places like San Francisco or New York or Los Angeles or DC to find and build community because we needed those kind of urban bastions of safety. And with the cultural change that we've seen over the last 30 years, you know, people might still be moving, but they can move in Indiana to a place like Bloomington, or they can move in Texas to a place like Austin. Um, you don't have to go all the way to the coasts anymore, and I, I think that's awesome. That is right. That is certainly right. But uh, we certainly have to remember our freedoms are not... You're fine. Um, so sorry, it's going to be edited out. Uh, and it, but but the country has to, has not on is not free yet. Of course. And and we don't have our total rights yet. We have a lot to do in in winning our total rights here yet. And a lot of work is coming forward. Uh, and we have a lot of people like yourself who go out and document these things and tell stories that help us understand where we're headed. And there are, are safe havens in the United States besides the coastal uh, cities that we have. Tell me a little bit more in your book about some other things that you've documented and where you think that this could lead to in the future for you. And do you have any more plans for books in the future? Yeah. You know, to your point, I think we're we're getting to this moment where I think cultural acceptance is getting ahead of legal acceptance at the federal level. Unfortunately, gridlock in D.C. and, and stonewalling and political fundraising and that kind of thing and just the composition of Congress has prevented us from getting full LGBT protections at the federal level. And yet traveling across the country, you can see that most Americans are reaching a point where they are LGBT accepting. So unfortunately, we're kind of at this moment where we kind of have to wait for Congress to catch up with um, where America's heart is and where America's heart is going. Um, you know, I see that everywhere. One of my favorite places I went to for the book was Johnson City, Tennessee, in eastern Tennessee. Right. That's where I, uh, it's, you know, Appalachian town with the, like this. Right in the Smoky yeah, Mountains. Yeah, it's just beautifully situated the downtown is you know 1920s architecture uh, i'm not sure if it's apocryphal or not but everyone talks about al capone having like hidden out there or something i'm not sure <laughs> if that's true but it makes a nice story and that's what i love about appalachia is a lot of nice stories that maybe we can't quite verify but they're fun to tell um 
But yeah, I, you know, I have such an amazing community of LGBTQ friends there. I think people can build chosen family, um, which is, you know, non-blood relatives who support you. Mm -hmm. that can help you survive in a place like Tennessee. Uh, that can help you find acceptance and love there. Um, I just hope the, the, you know, I went to so many places in the book, but I just hope it, the people who read it are inspired to go take a little road trip of their own, find a gem near you. That's great. And, and I like the fact family of choice versus biological family sometimes. You know, that is, I'm sure you know too, <clears throat> a lot of the LGBT community are closer to their family of choice versus their biological family. And that's, and that's changing, though. I think more acceptance is coming in the country, and I'm sure you've found this too, but we have a long way to go. And I, would, I was curious, what, when you went out and met people and talked with them, you know, what kind of feedback did they give you as, as a trans person? Yeah. Did, and do you uh, think that that is moving forward too? Because I know last Wednesday was uh, TDOR, mm -hmm. and uh, that is, and we, we, we are, we're doing another series about a person who is in transition now. Yeah. And that has been a really eye opening thing for me. Uh, she came out of the Midwest and uh, married, was in the Army, married, and has a family and everything, and now she's going through transition 20 years later. Yeah. And so tell me some of your thoughts on that process. I mean, as far as uh, do you see acceptance coming more in the future, or what do you think is going to happen there? Uh, absolutely. I mean, I think LGBT, the movement for LGBT acceptance and LGBT civil rights relatively speaking, I think is going fast. I, of course, it feels slow from the perspective of being a member of that community. But if you look at like public opinion polling, 10 years ago, support for same-sex marriage was not a majority position in this country. And, and now it, it's a strong majority position. Um, this, I think transgender rights are headed in the same direction. I even just observing over my own experience, I came out and transitioned in 2012. Um, and, you know, like eight years later, um, gosh, people are, are so much better informed. People, people approach your experience in your life so much more sensitively. And writing a book like the book I wrote felt so much more possible in 2017 than it even would have in 2010, right? Exactly. Uh, so much has changed. Um, it's just like a stone rolling down a mountain, I think. Um, and I'm I'm the beneficiary of that change, and I just I'm trying to pay it forward the best I can. Excellent. And what do you think about uh, the uh, there's a, as many of the younger people in our country do not re even remember you know what it was like uh, 20, 30, 40 years ago, and uh, I'm going to share a story. Well, uh, with another one, people I'm going to be interviewing later yeah. about how we went through so many changes back then and progress has happened. A lot of people, you know, myself included, I would not have had my career. I had a successful career working for large Fortune 500 corporations and my former partner as a police officer and a former Marine, you know, we would not have had our careers to either one of us if we had been out. Yeah. And, uh, but... And still not changed enough yet. Some people still choose not to be out, and that's their choice, of course. But we want to move towards a position where we pe people can be who they really are, and that's what we, where we should be at. Uh, do you have any ideas on what we could do to help move this uh, forward, you know, from your perspective? What do you think would be some of the top items we should continue to do or work on to get education out there? I think that's one of the big things, probably. Yeah, I think storytelling is such a powerful vehicle. So the work you're doing, interviewing LGBT people and 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 showcasing, um, showcasing their lives and experiences, is like is the literal like stuff of change right now. I think in the kind of long view of history, it's so important to know our LGBTQ history, and it's denied us because it's you know we don't we can only learn it through oral tradition and through books and uh, that you Correct. don't always get taught in school or that kind of thing. I've, I've 
have read this year um, memoirs by Gilbert Baker, the creator of the Rainbow Pride flag, and Monica Helms, who created the Transgender Pride flag, and learned a lot about their